we've got a nice prominent apex here. And this, uh, this for me, doesn't require any augmentation. Uh, and I think purely because it's nicely defined, we're going to leave that as it is. But if you turn your head just this way, what we do have is some flattening in the mid face. And in this area, as I said before, we've got the superficial fat pad and the deep fat pad. And in this area, one of the first areas to lose volume with aging is the deep medial cheek fat. And this is a potential target for today to create a more youthful mid face. Back to the middle, please. Finally, we're looking at what's under the eye, commonly known as the tear trough. We have another deep fat pad that lives under here, known as the sooth. And the medial sooth starts to atrophy with aging too. And so this is definitely a target for us to brighten the eyes and rejuvenate the under eye today. So what I see here is a upper and mid face sequence. If your patient comes and tells you, I'm looking tired, what can you do? The sequence that we recommend and we teach is temples, cheeks, and then tear trough. And so that's exactly what we're going to do today for the mid face. That's part one of our treatments. But we're not finished with the facial assessment. We have to look at the lower third as well. The lower third is the base of the nose to the menton, which is the base of the chin. And if you can turn again, please, Marie. We can see that Marie has a nicely defined jawline, but what we can afford here is a little bit more definition in the corner. And what that will do is it will start to pull this superficial jowl fat more laterally, and it will create a more smooth jawline, which is continuous all the way to the chin. So I'm interested in creating a bit of support down on the corner of the jaw. And then right here, as was mentioned, we have the pre-jowl sulcus. And you can see that when you compress the tissues, there's a break just there. So I would like to create some deep structure there to try and transition the chin to the jawline in a more youthful, smooth fashion. And now we can look at the chin. So even more if you can turn. This is, this is important. The chin can transform the face, but we need to know when and when not to treat. This was shown to you earlier, which is Ricketts line. But that doesn't assess the chin, it assesses the lips. In order to assess the chin, what we need to do first is get the face in the right horizontal plane. So you need to tilt your head down a little. And then we want to make sure that the chin is in vertical line with the nasion of the nose. And this, you can see here, is perfectly in line. So I'm not interested in creating any more anterior projection for Marie, because I don't think that will help. <coughs> However, what I do notice is that we have here what's known as a labiomental crease. And this forms because as we lose volume in our mandible with aging, the muscle here, the mentalis muscle, loses its support and it starts to upwards rotate. And in doing so, we form a crease. So how do we drop that? We're gonna just use some filler in this area to drop down the chin. And that's gonna create an elongated lower third which will be beautifying and feminizing for Marie. So once I've created the chin and the pre-jowl sulcus and created the jawline, the final place on the face that I'm interested in treating is the lips. The lips are the most dynamic area of the face. We have all these muscles that insert into the modiolus of the mouth, which is here. So we have our zygomaticus muscle, we have our elevator muscles, we have our depressor muscles, we have our rosorius going horizontally, and all of these muscles insert into the modulus. And that means it's a, the lips are a very challenging area to treat. And you will get the best results with lip filler once you've actually created the scaffolding around the rest of the face. And that, that's something that took me a few years to start to see in my own practice. If you have a look at the lips, turn this way for me. Marie has really beautiful lips and a well-defined border. I notice that the upper lip has a little less fullness than the bottom lip, but in general, there isn't much projection to be achieved in the lips. Therefore, with the lips, I'm just gonna use a small amount of Juvederm Volbella with a cannula just to create some fullness in those lips without trying to create projection. If you just blow a kiss for me like this, that's brilliant. Always ensure you examine the patient's lips when they're away from the teeth and, and isolated against those muscles that insert into the corner of the mouth. This is when you can see the natural shape of the lips and the body of the lips. Can I see your teeth, please? 
really important to assess the teeth to make sure that any change in lip volume is purely due to the lip and not associated with the dentition. So, in summary, we're going to treat Marie in two phases. Phase one, upper and mid face. And phase two, lower face and lips. And before we begin, I just want to draw on some of the uh, vascular anatomy that I think is really important for beginners to understand. Marcus, how's everyone doing? Yeah, I think we're all good in there. Is anyone any questions at this point after marking up? Any particulars yet? No? Fine. No, I think we're ready to go, Tris, if you want to draw the uh, vascular sure. on. Okay. Yeah, so we're just going to zoom in here. And Marie, what I'd like you to do is bite your teeth together. What I'm feeling here is the masseter muscle, one of the main chewing muscles of the face. Just anterior to the masseter, and you can feel this on yourself, you have the facial artery that emerges onto the jawline. So you have the common carotid artery, you can feel that pulsating, and that bifurcates into your internal carotid, which supplies the brain and the eyeball. And then you have the external carotid. And as injectors, we should all have a good understanding of the external carotid artery. The first important branch is the facial artery. And that makes its way over to the corner of the mouth in a tortuous route. If you open your jaw and relax. So this is a tortuous pathway because it allows the neck to move and the jaw to open. The facial artery gives off its branches to the lips, inferior and superior labial arteries. All of these vessels are deep. They live in layer four of the face. So that means that any injection that I do in this part of the face needs to be superficial in layer two, otherwise I risk traumatizing, or even worse, with the facial artery. The facial artery terminates in the lateral nose as the angular artery. But there are some interesting anastomoses with the internal circulation that happen here which are really important for beginners' injections, injectors to understand. So, number one, facial artery. I'm going to talk about another branch of the external carotid artery now, which is the maxillary artery. Can I have a blue pencil, please? Thank you. So the maxillary artery is another branch of the external circulation, and it swings behind the ramus of the mandible, and it emerges out the skull, if we turn this way, it emerges out the skull in the infraorbital foramen, coming out as the infraorbital artery, and the mental foramen, which is known as the mental artery. And I can show you this on a skull. What we have here are little exit points of the skull where neurovascular bundles emerge. So you have a nerve artery and vein coming out of here, and a nerve artery and vein coming out of here. And interestingly, they're all in a vertical plane to one another. So you have the supraorbital notch, you have the infraorbital artery, and you have the mental foramen. And they're in two vertical lines either side of the midface. So we've got the maxillary artery that comes out of these two. These are coming out of layer five. So deep injections medial to the mid pupillary line are caution zones for us. And we want to be using a cannula or definitely aspirating if we're using a needle down on the chin. How many people in here treat chins at the moment? The lower face area? Hands up? Okay. It's about half of you. Okay. Perfect. Great. The third vessel is the superficial temporal artery. You can feel this on yourself. You can feel a pulsation just anterior to the upper tragus. And this vessel courses its way in the hairline and supplies the scalp. The superficial temporal artery gives off a vessel that traverses across the midface, known as the transverse facial. Fortunately, this is beneath the cheekbone that I want to treat, and it runs in layer four, which means that our injections down on the cheekbone tend to avoid the transverse facial artery. So Marcus, we've got three vessels. We've got the facial artery, we've got the <coughs> maxillary artery, and we've got uh, the superficial temporal artery. Mm -hmm. What I finally want to show you is what a lot of injectors are concerned about, which are the, the big scary risks with injectables. If I can just have the purple pencil again, please. Which is uh, vascular occlusion, and when it can go particularly wrong, 
uh, more severe uh, injury to the retina, which uh, obstructs the retina from its blood. And up here we have the supraorbital notch, which I showed you on the skull earlier. The blood vessels that come out of here are not part of the internal circulation. They are part uh, external circulation. They are part of the internal circulation, and they are branches of the ophthalmic artery. So wherever these vessels communicate with the external circulation are where we have our particular danger zones. So we naturally have our supraorbital vessel and our supratrochlear vessels coming out of the uh, upper face from the skull. And we have some connections. So we have an anastomosis here between the frontal branch of the superficial temporal artery and we have a dorsal nasal artery that anastomoses here with the facial, with, with the angular artery. And that's why, as beginners, there are some absolute no-go zones. I see a lot of this on Instagram, a lot of noses being treated, um, and I see a lot of uh, injections in areas such as the cabella that scare me to death. <laughs> so the areas that I recommend we start at beginners is definitely not the nose, definitely not the lateral nose, and certainly no fillers beyond the temple into the forehead and cabella. Really good places to start as beginners, along the zygoma and very superficially in the lips. Today I'm going to show you a combination of techniques to rejuvenate the mid-face. So we're going to get the face prepped and I'm going to hand over to you for a few minutes, Marcus. No problem. Okay. So I think when we're doing the treatment today, like Tris has mentioned before, we saw the different layers of the face. It's really useful from day one to be really focusing around, are we in layer one, are we in layer five, and then anywhere in between. And when you can think like that, you can start putting together great treatment plans that really help. You know, like, like Tris said, you can put a huge amount of filler in the wrong compartment and actually won't get the result you want, or you can waste a lot of filler actually by doing that. And that's particularly with some certain products such as skin boosters where we can easily lose products if we're in the wrong plane. Similarly, we can get those results where you see, you know, people smile and you get that huge kind of lift from the cheeks. It's just because it's not been placed in the right plane again. So when we're doing today's treatment, I really want you to think about that. And I'll ask as we go, where are we in the, which, which tissue plane are we in? And why are we in that plane? Trying to think about that from day one helps. Because I think too often as um, injectors, when we start, we're very focused around sort of treating just on particular points. You know, we don't really think about why we're treating at that point and particularly the indirect results we get from doing that. So for example, I'm sure actress will mention when we're treating the temples, we can actually lift the corners of the mouth. And that's because we're down to bone, we're subsmass, we're getting that lift through the face. So I think trying to think about how we're going to treat and then the indirect results we might get from that can be really, really useful. Does anyone have any questions at the moment on anatomy or anything that we've talked about so far or what we're going to be doing? Or anything particularly they want to see as well when we're doing this full face demo as well? No? Perfect. Right, Tris, so we're all good in here. Excellent. How, how, how full are the seats? <laughs> I mean, they're probably about... Uh, four, yeah, 40? 40%? Okay, four. We're looking good, though. We're getting busier, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, where, so where are we starting then, Tris? So, Talk us through what you're doing first. Look, there, there are a few lines that I always draw on the face. Um, first of all, um, before we talk about what we're going to do, I'm just going to show you. I'm going to change my gloves now to sterile gloves. And Emily's done a thorough uh, skin prep with um, Clinicept. And uh, one of the most important things we do is to stay as sterile as we can with filler injections. A lot of the complications associated with fillers can be traced back to poor aseptic technique at the start. So I'm just changing my gloves off screen. How many of you use sterile packs as part of your with fillers? Do you use sterile packs generally? Um, no, there's been no LMX on the patient there. No, 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 no. So um, I think sterile packs are you know, definitely what we should be using for all filler treatments. Still know some practitioners that don't, and I think you know, five years ago we never really did use sterile packs for filler, but I think the more data we've got, the more evidence to show that actually, like Tris said, a lot of the complications we get, deep tissue infections, which to be honest, are the last things you want when you're starting out, is like an abscess on the cheek. So make sure you just clean, 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 and just keep cleaning, is my advice really when you're starting out. Marcus, remind me to talc and powder my hands next time we do this. <laughs> I'll bring the towel next time. <laughs> it's pretty hot backstage. <laughs> We've got a fan on, Marie. <laughs> You've got it's the easy cool. job. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is, gloves, yeah. Okay, almost, almost ready. 
Okay, so a little bit more drawing, just marking some of those key points that Tristan's explained, and then we will be beginning. <laughs> right, white pencil, please. So I just want you to sit forward again one more time. I'm going to draw on some important lines that I think we should always be drawing on when we're considering doing cheek fair treatments. Turn that way for me. So everyone feel on their own face, either side of their zygomatic bone. If you can draw beautiful drawings, you'll get beautiful results. So we're going to draw on the inferior border of the zygoma, and we're going to draw on the superior border when it meets the lateral orbital margin, and then here we're going to draw on temporal crest, which moves up this way. And what I've done here now is I've found the temporal fossa, and I've found the zygomatic bone. And I press hard here, and I need to make sure that between my fingers is cheekbone. This is how you can make sure that when you're doing your ejections, you make sure you touch bone. Now, along the cheekbone somewhere, you're going to find a suture that connects the zygoma to the temporal bone. And this is my first point. Emily's going to show us on a skull where that is, whilst I find this. We find a suture just here. So you can see from this... So there's a little notch above the field. Just it. here is a really great landmark to start when you're marking up on cheek filler. So I've marked up the middle of that suture, and then I'm just going to go half a centimetre in front and half a centimetre back. And that follows the angle of the cheekbone. This is how I mark on my cheekbone filler. So this is how we create that lovely lateral projection of the zygoma. I'm going to do the same on the other side. Just want to turn towards me. Nothing sterile there, of course. Pardon? Nothing sterile there. In what sense of where we're drawing? Yeah. yeah, so we'll clean again before we inject usually. So as long as you know, we're kind of marking out not exactly where we're going to inject, we're also not pushing the pigment of the pencil into the skin, so we'll be, we'll be treating obviously outside of that area. Yeah, my, my needle will never go through the deep pencil markings. Go on this side. So welcome to everyone who's joining us in the room. So we're just starting our first marking up of the first start place of the treatment. So we're doing upper face to start with, and we're working our way um, down through to the mid face. Towards me, please. Perfect. I think it's really important like Chris is doing now to just get that symmetry really right. When you're starting out, those boluses, you can really tell after you've done treatment. You know, when you, you look at them from the front and the end, they're like, is it equal? And you look at them and you're like, <laughs> um, yes, they have to go back in and do a little bit more. So spending a lot of time marking up. Injecting is almost the least part of time really that's spent when you're doing injecting. Absolutely I think agree. the majority of it is just marking up. And particularly with this, I really find spending time getting it equal. And, you know, and, and also, what I always do before with patients is show them the mirror and say, let's have a look at your face, and show them they're not equal to start with, because they'll always pick that up on, and that's why your before photos are so important. Okay, now we're going to find our point on the temple. My objective here is not to teach how to do this treatment, because this definitely lives in the intermediate to advanced treatment category. But I'm going to be marking up here. Just briefly, we've got deep temporal vessels moving far posterior to this, and we've got the superficial temporal artery lateral to this. So deep on bone here is my target. So let's move on to some treatments. Does anyone treat temples here? Just have interest. The gunshot technique. Yeah, you do, okay, fine. There's only a couple in here, Tris, so. Great. So I've got unprimed Juvederm Voluma here, and we're gonna talk through two different ways to inject. So I prime the needle, and want to turn that way for me. And then here's how we teach beginners to start injecting. I'm going to do point one in each of those points. First of all, I'm going to pull the skin back and go where that point was, touch down onto the zygoma, and then my finger 
grabs the skin and the needle at the same time. This creates a stable syringe. And here, I can aspirate. And then I can slowly inject 0.1 down onto periosteum. So this is the easiest way we found for beginners to start injecting. And how much are you using per point at the moment there? So that's just 0.1 there, Marcus. And then, option number two, we grab this with our finger and thumb very tight and we do the one-handed technique. So we pinch, we touch down on bone, we aspirate, and then we slowly inject with our palm. This one will take a little bit more time to get used to. So let's continue here. We're doing point one across three different parts and it's easy for me to find bone because I've spent so long marking it up. <laughs> right, so I've got point seven left in my syringe, but even at this point, I can start to see some of the lifting that that's achieved. But we're not going to have a look together until I've done the temple. And I'm going to use the rest of this 0.7 down in the temporal fossa. We watch out for any superficial vessels. And just gently open your jaw. This relaxes the temporalis muscle. Sharp scratch. One, two, three. Perfect. Touching down on bone. We're going to aspirate. And then all of this is going into the temple. Now, it can't flow upwards. It can't flow forwards. The only way it can flow is backwards into the hairline. So I'm putting some pressure with my thumb here just to usher the filler into where the volume loss is. Can you guys see that filling slowly? If you look on the bottom, you can see it slowly moving down. So what I find here, Marcus, is if the patient the next day feels a bit of tightness in this muscle when they yawn or when they stretch their face, it's because the muscle itself is being stretched. Mm -hmm. This muscle adheres very tightly down on bone and you cannot get filler underneath muscle here. The filler is technically sitting in the inferior fibers of the temporalis muscle. And also with this, what you sometimes notice is you get a bit of an engorgement of the superficial vessels over the top, but that's, that's normal with a temple treatment like this. So in my complications talk this morning, I explained injecting slowly is one of the key ways of being safe as an injector. We're in no rush to do this, and we're going to take our time. <coughs> Thank you, Emily. And then we'll have a bit of swelling here, and I'm just going to usher that down into the temporal fossa. Now. If you can sit forward for us, I just want to see what difference this has made to the eyebrows and the eyes. So, what do you see in the right eye? We've got a fuller temple, we've got a higher brow height, and you can see a lot more of the iris in the right eye. And that's because the eye is brighter and wider in the right side. Even though it's on the upper eyelid as well, you can really see the difference there, the way it's changed the, the shape of the eye too. It's yep. much better. So, we're now going to treat the mid-face. So we're sticking with Juvederm Voluma, and I'm going to be treating this deep medial cheek fat compartment. So this is the nasolabial superficial fat. We're not interested in that, and in fact we should never treat this fat pad because it grows in size with aging. We don't need to add volume here. But underneath this, that's where our deep fat pad lives, and it's one of the first ones to lose volume as we age. So, I've got here my pilot needle that helps get my cannula into the face. And my entry point is just going to be vertically down from the lateral orbital rim, bevel facing forward, it's less painful for the patient. Sharp scratch, one, two, three. And that pilot needle is sitting in layer two of the face. And I've got my cannula here, it's 25 gauge, 38 millimeter cannula. And Emily's going to take out the pilot needle. And I can show you how we treat the deep medial fat. So what layer are we going down to when we're treating this area? So the, the fat pad lives in layer four. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you, just by way of demonstration, this is the subcutaneous layer. 
and we do not want to treat in this layer. What we want to do is press down against muscle. This muscle here is the orbicularis oculi muscle, and you can see the whole muscle puckering down when I press down. And we just have to gently pop through this into layer four. And you'll see that in one, two, three, pop. And now I'm in the deep fat. I'm going to show you that one more time. So I'm pressing down against the orbicularis oculi, and then I'm pushing through there, and it gives way. Any pain there, Marie? No pain, good. And here, I can be quite generous. I'm going to inject fanning, anterograde and retrograde, and I'm going to be putting product into the deep medial cheek fat. We use a cannula here because, as I explained, we have the infraorbital artery, the infraorbital nerve, and we definitely don't want to put any trauma on or put our needle anywhere near that. And actually, I've ended up using here half a mil, and that was quite quick, but we've revolumized the deep medial cheek fat. This is the precursor to treating the tear trough. If someone has volume deficit in the mid cheek here, and we don't treat the deep medial fat before the tear trough, then you will not get a long lasting result. So let's have a look at what that treatment alone has done. You can sit forward please. So we can really start to see that we've created this volume now, and what's left is a very particular <coughs> fat pad, which is called the medial souf, and that's my final target for rejuvenating Marie's, the right side of her mid-face. So even if you look further down in the face as well, so the nasal labial fold, the marionette, everything starts to look a little bit better, doesn't it, indirectly, without having to treat those areas, which are you know, very difficult to treat, to be fair, like the marionette, so this is a really good way to indirectly target them. Okay, Marcus, so now what we have here is Juvederm Volbella. We want to use a, a softer product in the under eye area, head back. Even though this is still one of the deep fat pads, chin up, it's going to look like I'm in the subcutaneous fat. I'm not. It's just that the tissues are so thin in the under eye area. Now, tear troughs, I believe, are the hardest area on the face to treat. And it takes some time to get this technique right but I am approaching in the same way and popping underneath the muscle. And here I'll take my cannula towards the orbital rim. And you can see here, and with my non-dominant hand, I can feel where I'm at. I'm in the medial sooth. And here I'm gonna start injecting micro boluses of Juvederm Volbella to restore the volume that's been lost under the eye. Really important not to overfill the under eye. Does not require it. How much do you use per side usually with tear troughs, the little bellatrous? I, sort of, I, I sort of like to see how, I, how, it, how it gets on. Um, right now I've used 0.2 and I'm already thinking that's plenty. Great. And sit forward again please and look into the mirror. More? Yeah? What do you guys think? Yeah. Touch more. Um. Touch more, okay, we'll go for touch more. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So I think it's just a careful area tear trough, you know, you don't want to over-treat it, you know, you do get a little bit of swelling sometimes afterwards, so you want to kind of be treated just to about 90% probably to get to where you want to be within a few days. But I'd agree a little bit more probably just to soften that off slightly more. Do many people treat tear troughs here themselves? Yeah. Okay. I've used 0.3 there, Marcus. Okay. One more time, Marie, if you want to come forward. No, I think that's done it. Really? The extra 0.1 has made the difference, hasn't it? So we can really see a nice change. And now, one thing I want to test, if you just want to give us a big smile and show your teeth, please. We notice this is important, okay? We see the right side of the smile is higher and more natural and more genuine as a smile. And there's a reason for that. We've got the muscle that connects from the modialis to the zygoma, the zygomaticus major. And what I've done here is I've put some filler underneath that muscle. When filler goes underneath the muscle, it makes it stronger. Its contractility goes up, which means it's more likely to contract in a more meaningful way when she expresses, and you get more natural expression 
if you treat the right layer with the right products. I'm now gonna move over to the patient's left and complete the same sequence of treatments. It would be a good time for Emily and yourself to uh, engage with the audience, see if there's anything we can help with in terms of education. And perhaps we can also talk about how we also deliver our training, Marcus. No problem. So, is there any questions so far of where we are? Yes, hello. Well, this is but it looks to me like the right lateral eyebrow is lower than the left, and the pillar has pushed things down. Can you hear that in the back, Chris? I, I, I couldn't hear that, I'm afraid. Okay, so just saying that the right eyebrow could be lower on the side that you've treated and um, over the other side. Let's have a look at that. I mean, I, I would probably... Do you think the right side lower? Let's have a look how everything looks. You are <laughs> um, No, I, th I mean, I would say that the, when you look at globally, look at the, if you look at the right side compared to the left, I think I would argue the right eyebrow probably does look a little bit lifted. And the whole, the whole eyelid, the upper eyelid does look a bit more open. It looks a little... A little wider. Do you feel you mean the tip of the eyebrow or just? I mean, I lateral eyebrow just looking at the tail. Be lower and less arched than the left. At the end of the treatment, Marcus, we're going to show the before photos against the after photos. So That'll be a good test. We okay. can have a good comparison there. Okay, fine. We'll we can that. put everyone's mind at ease that I haven't made this worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I think the lateral canthus has even run up. The yeah, I mean, yeah. Nice, beautiful curve to I would agree. Yeah, it just changes the whole the shape of the eye, doesn't it? The shape is a, a much more yeah beautiful shape, absolutely. But so we'll have a look at the before and afters. That'd be nice to see when we when we finish there. So yeah. we can have a look. Anything else? We've got you guys. Marcus, how many people in the crowd use a cannula to treat the medial aspects of the cheek? So deep medial fat pad. Who uses a cannula for this area at the moment? So not very many actually, no, not very many. Um, I think it's, do you use needle then though, is it don't, or do you just not treat it at the moment? Do you just treat the bony area? Yeah, just bony area, yeah. I think it's, when, when, you, when you start it out, it's often how it's taught, isn't it? You need three boluses and you sort of, you always have this problem with patients, they have great cheekbones up to about kind of mid-pupillary and then they have this flattening in the middle. And when, when you get to grips with using a cannula, particularly for the deep medial fat pad, it can completely transform um, that part of the face. And often what we find is as we age, the lateral aspect, we don't lose too much of that as I go in a kind of projection. It's more the deep medial fat pad, like Tris said, it's the first one that goes. And being able to treat that well, in some people you can get away with just treating that, and it completely changes, particularly the tear trough in the under eye area. And like Tris says, doing tear trough before you've done that, it's, it's, a, it's like a playing a losing battle really. You're better off trying to revolumize that medial um, cheek really before. So as, uh, oh, is that another question? Am I interrupting? Absolutely, no, just saying that sometimes when you treat the, um, the deep medial fat pad well, you don't have to treat the tear trough, and I'd agree with that, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So as a preferred partner with Allegan, we're very lucky to be able to use their products, and what we're able to do is offer one-to-one -one mentoring. So if anybody wants to actually have a particular learning need met, you can join us in clinic and you can ask us in advance which treatment you'd like to learn. Maybe it's temples, maybe it's jawline, maybe you just want to get really good at lips. And you will have a one-to-one -one tutorial to be able to improve and learn the anatomy around that area. And we've recently launched that with Juvederm Volux in the lower face, which includes some online <coughs> learning about the product and the anatomy. And that will be expanding to other treatment areas in the coming months. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really useful. People often, if you've, if you've started practicing, but there's a particular area, let's say, you know, your medial cheek, using a cannula in that, in that area, we can just do a one-to-one -one session where it's just you, just with the, with the trainer, and then you bring your own patient, and provide the products, and you can just focus on that one area and, um, and really, really get good at it and feel comfortable after doing it. I think traditionally we used to teach in bigger groups, and that's fine, but I think, like I said, in the smaller room before, you often feel a bit, sometimes a bit nervous about asking questions because there's practitioners from all different backgrounds. And I think having that one-to-one -one ability makes it a really nice way to, to learn. And we can do that for literally anything. So any area of the face you're looking at focusing on, or particularly if you wanted to do lower face, chin, jawline with Volux and learn more about using Volux, then we can run the one-to-one -one session for that too. So particularly today, we're calling those spark appointments. And uh, you can come and find us in our room if that's interesting for you. But I get the sense that a lot of practitioners today are at the beginning of their careers, in which case a um, uh, foundation programme might be more appropriate. Mm. 
So yes, yeah, so we're doing the Spark Slots where you have today a 495, but we're also running a competition today where you can win a free slot. But as probably many of you have heard already, you have to have the photograph taken with our Instagram frame. And then if you just tag us, put it on Instagram, by the end of the weekend, one of you guys will win a one-to-one -one slot doing anything you wish um, from that uh, day. So find us with Instagram frame. I think we're in, they're in our back room. I'm sure Tim will be happy to help you out with that. And uh, take some photographs with, with the frame and then put them online and we'll, uh, we'll pick a winner after the weekend. So. All right, so here we are, Marcus. We're sitting the tear trough on the other side. Yep. Perfect. Again, I'm not. You do not want to treat the tear trough in the subcutaneous plane. Number one, you'll get edema, and number two, the angular artery spreads out its vessels in layer two. We have to be in layer three in order to treat the tear trough. You can see me approaching here. You go for 0.3 again on this side, Tris. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well done, Marie. Almost done. A few. And what I do is I don't create uh, linear threads in the tear trough, because I think that's an easy way to obstruct lymphatics. Instead, what we do is little micro bonuses. And I found that ever since I started doing that, I don't get the same uh, edema under the eyes that I rarely used to cause when I created large deposits of filler. Okay, let's do a little bit of massage now. So for me, this is the first sequence complete. How are we doing for time, Marcus? I'm absolutely fine still, yeah, no, that's good. Are you thinking about moving on to the lower, the lower face now? We can do a break, or we can move on. What does everyone want to do? Five minute break, or to carry on just going through? Carry on. Carry on, everyone wants to carry on, just let's, let's keep okay, going. Let's keep going. So just sit forward for us. <laughs> so we've got a lovely rejuvenation now, the temperature of the face. <laughs> What's, what's funny, Marcus? They're making fun of me. <laughs> no, you're fine, Chris. Carry on. <laughs> what if I need a break? No, yeah. it's fine. I'm doing fine. Right, now we're going to start using a new product. We're using Juvederm Volux. Volux is the most projecting filler in the Juvederm range, and it's got twice the cohesivity and twice the elasticity as Juvederm Voluma, but amazingly, it's just as easy to extrude. And so we're going to be using Juvederm Volux. We need a heavy, strong filler to reshape the lower face. And that's what we're going to be using today. We're going to start with the gonial angle. And we're going to create some lovely definition in the corner of the jaw to try and pull back the jawline. And create some more tension and straighten the jawline. Head back. Has anyone here used Volux, the new filler? No? So look, ha have a look at this, Marcus. Yes. We're just yes. going to create a little tower, and you can see it's unusual for a filler to be able to stand up like this. Mm -hmm. This is a demonstration of the elasticity of the filler, the ability for it to create its own shape. And that's what we want when we're treating the lower face. Now, I've got a special technique to show you. If you turn your face this way, normally I don't care much about which way the bevel faces, apart from in the lips and apart from in the corner of the jaw. If we're going to create a significant bolus down onto bone, then the bevel is going to tell us which way the filler will spread. So I want the filler to stay right at the corner, so my bevel is facing down and laterally. So what I'm going to do here is find the corner of the jaw, turn your face a bit more please, and I'm going to create a sharp scratch, one, two, three down onto the corner. And I'm touching here the mandible. Here we can do an aspirate. And then we're going to go from 0.3 to 0.5 and I'm going to decide as I go how much I think we need. And what you'll find as well when you start using Volux, um, I have to say one-to-one -one training slot, is that actually it's Extrusion pressure is actually quite similar to the lumen. You expect it to be very difficult to inject, but actually it's amazingly <coughs> easy to inject, but gives you that really good towering projection as well that you get, get as a product, product too. What is the medium size? I believe it's a 27 gauge. Is that right, Tris, you're using? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so let's see where we've got to here. This is 0 0.4. 
and there you can see a very nice defined corner of the jaw which has started to pull things laterally. It's very good. So if you want to turn all the way towards me, you'll find this is one of the most difficult treatments to do because you just don't know what to do with your hands. And I think often you just have to move around. So same again, I want the bevel facing down and out. Find the corner of the jaw. One, two, three. Touch on bone. And that's good. And we're gonna slowly inject here. I'm going to take it down to the 0.2. So was this 0.5 per side? Oh, it's a 0.4 per side there, Marcus. 0.4, OK. And we're creating some great definition. Mm -hmm. So we're sticking with Juvederm Volux. Now sit forward. Always great to assess the patient sat forward. Look how much that's lifted the, pre the jowl area already. The next area, what we, what we do in the lower third and what we teach is that we start on the bone. So we're going to start restructuring the mandible, whether it's the corner of the jaw, the front of the chin, or the pre jowl sulcus. Once we've done all the bony treatments and created bony support, we then move to the subcutaneous layer two, and that's usually with a cannula. So I've got a second syringe of Juvederm Volux now. Thank you very much. And I wait to come back. Now, People always ask me, but isn't this where the facial artery is? Okay, remember, the facial artery is way lateral to this, it's here. This is actually quite an avascular plane. And I've got the mental frame in here, and I've got the facial artery here. This is okay to inject down on bone, I'm still going to aspirate. And my, my marking is where the tissue breaks, which is just there. My thumb stops the filler from extending onto the underside of the mandible. My finger keeps it between that, that range. Sharp scratch, one, two, three. Touch down on bone. And I'm gonna stabilize. And I'm gonna aspirate. And here we're just gonna give 0.25. And I, I love it when you see this. If you can see a little bit of a uh, mound, it means it's in the right place, and you can just massage that in like this. And you can start to see how, this is, what, this is what I love about jawline treatments, is that sometimes all you have to do is fill in the gaps to create a striking jawline. Turn this way, please. Same again on this side. One, two, three, and one of this one. I think treating like this, when you're treating the jawline and treating to bone volus to start with, you can almost get away with just treating the, the bony loss really with boluses. And by the time you've done that, like Tris is showing, you almost have a jawline already. And then it's almost the icing on the cake that you can use volux in a more superficial plane with the cannula almost to join up and kind of draw the jawline on. And that's when you really get that sharp edge definition at the end when you kind of work with the, with the cannula too. You can see already it's looking, you've already pretty much created a great jawline just from doing the, a few small boluses up to bone. Fantastic. So, <laughs> we're going to switch to a cannula now. I'm happy with my needle treatments. Have we got an audience that treat the lower face, Marcus? Draw lines. Lower face? Anybody? Hopefully. A few, a few, yeah, a few. Great. But I haven't tried Volux yet, which is exciting for you guys. Too. Very much so. I just want to show this to you guys. The black arrow on the TSK cannulas, 
actually show us where the exit port is on the cannula. Generally, we want this black arrow facing forwards because that's where we want our projection to go. So the next treatment, Marcus, is going to be this labiomental crease. And the objective is to create a, uh, a splint so the mentalis can't rotate upwards and it actually softens down. It doesn't take much for that to happen. So we're going to go in like this, one, two, three, layer two. Okay. And you can see I'm in layer two because you can see the outline of my camera. And it can be a little, a little bit painful as I undermine the fibers of the mentalis which are inserting into the bone here. And I'm actually battling against them a little. And now I've got halfway across. I'm going to start to inject. And we're just going to be able to gently fan in products. Because Volux has got such good elasticity, it's all we need to soften this. We, um, we sometimes teach in our training that using the codes, this, uh, this would be C1. So it's, this is layer two. So we're literally just through doing this. So we're layer, layer two at this point. So you should be able to see the outline of the cannula when you do this. Hmm? The patient is very, very good at the gym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It can be a bit tough and hard to do painful on the left. It's tough. I think for me, the, this, this, this crease is one of those areas that people don't, no one comes into me and says, look, you know what I really want doing today? <laughs> this crease. But it's one of those areas when you do do it, it makes a massive difference. And often it's almost the tail end of another treatment. You're like, should we just try a little bit in the, uh, this area here? Next time they come in, put the jawline. You know, and it's like, that's the sort of introduction to things really, because massive impact is made here. Yeah. So here, Marcus, I'm just massaging this and I can feel it between my fingers. It's nice and balanced either side. And I just, want to, I just want to examine here to see the difference that's made. If you sit forward, please. And you can see what that's done. For me, I want to talk about something here, which is what we call the lower rule of thirds. So normally we've got one third, one third, and one third. Within the lower third, for ladies, we want an additional division of one third from the base of the nose to the opening of the mouth, another third opening of the mouth to the crease, and a final third crease to chin. And before, this final third was rotated upwards, we've elongated that, and what that's done is created a much more elegant shaped feminine lower third. And we've nearly got this jawline. I'm just gonna finish things off by using a cannula in the subcutaneous plane in the, in the pre-jowl area. Uh, I'm gonna need a little, a little bit more than this. Perhaps point two each side. Turn towards me. Perfect. So we've used a total of two mils of Volux in the lower third. So that's all I need, thanks. Any questions at this point about what we're doing? Okay, perfect. So I insert at the chin, going laterally. One, two, three. And that, again, that's the depth I want to be. Subcutaneous, sorry. And importantly, when I started treating jaw lines, I made a few mistakes. I was treating right on the underside of the jaw, thinking that's what I'd need to do to create some definition. But in fact, what you need to do is pretty much be one centimeter on the front of the mandible. And that's the only way to get the anterior projection we need to create a lovely jaw line. And this is a layer two subcutaneous fat cannula treatment. and we're gonna take it up to the inferior jowl fat. That much like the nasolabial folds, we don't wanna add superficial volume here because it's only gonna get heavier. So we stop at the medial border, and here I'm gonna to start to finish off the jawline with some linear threads with my cannula, and I'm gonna take it into a little lower linear thread as well, just to start connecting it up along the base of the jaw as well. <clears throat> and look here, you can even fan into the marionette area if required. And that is for me a completed <coughs> jawline on the patient's left. 
Would anyone do anything different? Any other? You know, what, what do people normally do with their jawlines? Is that kind of where they stop, or do they treat anywhere else? About that. Fine. Okay. Perfect, Tristan. Let's carry on. That's good. Ready. So we're just going to uh, make an entry point on this side again. One, two, three. Subcutaneous fat. Final point to a volux before we move on to the lips. So, you can see this, you turn your head that way please. We're in layer two of the face. And Marie's keenly watching her own treatment on the screen. Making sure I don't make any mistakes. Brilliant. Thank you. Can I have some gauze, please? Thank you. And what I'd like to do here is just do a little bit of massaging to make sure we've got a continuous jawline. So for me, Marcus, there is no such thing as being able to treat a single area in isolation. Every area is connected to the other, whether it's through its la layer three musculature, or whether it's in uh, indirectly revolumizing other areas when you treat others. And so everything is connected, and very quickly as practitioners, we should start to think about the full face approach, which is really just a combination of our linear threads and our boluses with a good understanding of facial aging and facial anatomy. Mm. No, absolutely, and as you can see, treating from where we're aging the most, we do not have to do some of the traditional treatments like the nasal labial fold treatment. I mean, there's just no need for it in this patient now. We've lifted, it looks great, it looks natural. And I think, you know, most of my patients, certainly, this is the look they want. They don't want to look like they've had loads of filler, they just want to look fresh and well slept. And I would agree here, you know, we've used quite a few mills, but you wouldn't really know, she just looks very well. So, Marcus, if you've got one of those, uh Patients that want to look great on selfies, and they really want that 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 uh, rectangular jawline, mm. that angle. We've got this lovely bolus. What we could do is connect this with some filler and create a really crisp jawline going this way. Mm. Um, and for me, uh, I just don't like that. And I think it looks a lot nicer for me to have a more natural uh, result. Um, and I think it really really works for her as we've got it now. Yeah, no, I agree, that's very good. Yeah. Have you, have you any more? Any more? Right. We're doing any treatment Products. onto the chin directly, Tris, in the midline, or are we gonna leave the chin? No, the um, we were happy with the projection on the chin. Yeah, no idea. Yeah. Didn't need any more. And through dropping this, for me, this that's, uh, that's great. I've just noticed here that we've got a little bit more um, to treat on the patient's right, and I just wanted to connect this with a drop more Volux before we move on to the lips. So many questions about lower face and what we've done so far. Seems simple enough. <laughs> how many mils in total? How many mils we use in total, Tris? Uh, I planned for this to be between six and seven mils. We've used uh, five. Five. We I'm opening our sick here. <coughs> so this comes back to my point. Depends where you are. Quite expensive, okay. potentially, indeed. But this is, you know, when we're talking, especially, and this is more, much more from a business point of view as a clinician, being able to sell multi-syringe treatments is where we should be aiming to, to treat because not only do we get a better result for the patient, um, but it's better for business as well. And there's, there's, a, there's a way to do that rather than, because, you know, really, a single syringe of filler doesn't really do a lot in most places of the face. And, Building a patient journey over a multitude of visits to you is often the best way to achieve this. And it sounds like a lot, six, seven mils, and you know, for one session, yeah, it, it is, and for most patients. But split this over two or three visits, and you get a result like they get that lasts you know, 18 months, it, it's, it's worth it to them. This comes back to what we were saying at the start, Marcus, mm. where if our patients see us as an expert, because we've trained and we've studied, and we know what we're doing, then we're able to develop treatment plans which do sequence over multiple visits, but can have a combination of multiple syringes 
And this, um, this is why we wanted to show the full face approach, because ultimately, we need to go beyond uh, the basics to thrive and build a thriving business in aesthetics in 2019. I think most patients who treat now, really, when they come to you, you know, this, the side of treatment, really when we're considering four mils as kind of your baseline, really. Generally, you know, over, over two visits, I'd usually do for, for all of my patients um, to be able to get a good result. Okay, the moment everyone's been waiting for. <laughs> That's we're doing, last, the we're lips. doing lips. <laughs> and, right, because we've done this labia mental crease, the lower lips should be anaesthetized. This is the um, branch of the trigeminal nerve from the mental foramen, which supplies the lower lip, should be nicely anaesthetized. If I had done the piriform fossa, the upper lip would be anaesthetized. So sometimes when you're doing the full face, you can have perfectly numb lips without having to put any topical anaesthetic on there. In this case, uh, we did actually put some topical 4% lidocaine onto the lips. Chin up. And this is the cannula approach. We're going to use volbella in the lips. We could use volift, but I wanted a much softer, much more natural result with um, uh, in someone who already has good anterior projection for their lips. One, two, three. I'm going into layer two with my cannula, as always. And then my objective is to enter up to the midline in both the upper and the lower lip with Volbella. In ladies, you want the fullness of the lips to live between my fingers, between the nasal alar. And that also extends to the width of the chin. So I, I'm generally going to put a lot less laterally in the lips and a lot more medially. The final thing to say on lips is that I'm always going to be superficial. There was a cadaveric study two years ago that showed that 2% of the blood vessels lived in the subcutaneous plane. And that's where we want to inject our filler. 80% of the time, they live deep to the orbicularis oris muscle. So we're never deep in the lips. I'm taking my time here, moving past the little fibrous divisions in the subcutaneous fat until I'm at the mid plane. And here I can gently inject Volbella, which is an incredibly soft cross-linked hyaluronic acid. Is anyone here treating lips with a cannula, Marcus? Anybody? Not many at all, no, only a few in here. Yeah, a few. Is that because people haven't, haven't had the training for it, or don't feel comfortable doing it, or don't like doing it? Okay. Is that because a patient doesn't like it, or just you don't like it? Do you? I think there's pros and cons to both, isn't there, really, depending on how we, how we treat. Uh, it can be more fiddly with a cannula, but once you get into the right plane, it's, you know, it's a nice treatment in the sense of bruising, swelling, your risk of a vascular occlusion goes down quite significantly as well. Okay, not much more needed than that. I've got a, the same again on the other side. I'm putting 0.25 on one side, and we can see it's got a lovely eversion to the lips, and some fullness there. And the half of the result will come from my massage at the end. I don't want to treat the border. In fact, I have a tendency not to treat the border, Marcus. Um, you get that white ridge on the upper lip that tells me that you've had lip filler done probably quite badly. Chin up, please. One, two, Unfortunately, that's the majority of patients we see are dealing with those sort of images in their face every day. <coughs> those lips are just really all not done very well. And you see that huge white border you get above the lips. You know, a lot of treatments we do in the lips that are done well, people don't. No, I think that's really the treatment we should be doing. Much more sort of natural, really, in a way. Like this lady's having today, to be honest. We'll push through this little pocket there. Well done. The lip has natural cushions in it. And what you saw me doing there was just pushing into one of the tubercles in the lower lip. The cushions are called tubercles, little fat pockets that give the lip its natural balance and shape. And when we start looking at lips properly, we, uh, we can identify these tubercles and we can know when to accentuate them and when to, uh, when to not accentuate them. 
Again, you can see the outline of my cannula. So you know here that I'm in layer two, the subcutaneous fat. The lips do have their own subcutaneous fat layer. If ever your glove goes into the oral cavity, we have to stop and change gloves. Right, and the finishing touch is just a massage. So I'm just going to take the lower lip and I'm going to roll it this way. And this just helps to create some convexity in the lower lip. So how much have you used in total, Tris? I've used just 0.5 in the lips here, Marcus. Okay. Now, we've used a total of six mils of filler. And it's, uh, it's important to say that I would not have achieved these kinds of results in the lips if I had started with the lips. And that's because once you create the structure around the lips, the muscles work more naturally and more harmoniously as they do in youth, and you get more beautiful results. So this Marie has made my job a lot easier than it otherwise it would have been. Thank you for not bleeding. <laughs> Thank you for uh, being an excellent patient for me. <coughs> Any lip filler questions about what we've done today? Or? And I've asked the um, uh, Gareth, the, uh, the camera manager today, to try and get a before photo and an after <coughs> photo so we can try and take a snapshot of Marie's after photo now in a uh, frontal view and also on an oblique view. And then hopefully we can compare to the before photos. So if we can just pan back there, we've got the before photos taken professionally. And we've got the after shot now. If you can zoom out a little bit. Yeah. And if you just want to turn your head this way, you can really see the rejuvenation and the beautification that's happened here. Turn slowly this way. That's fantastic. The lips are very good considering that's just half a mil. Yeah, she, uh, she does not look like she's had six months of filler, right? No. <laughs> Fantastic. Right, Marcus, I think I'm done here. Brilliant. Can I have a round of applause for Marie, please? <laughs>